Okay, got through our introduction. Here we are in Vayakra, chapter 1 through... <laughs> Vayakra, chapter 1. Sorry, guys. Okay, this is Vayakra, Leviticus chapter 1 through Leviticus chapter 6, verse 7. All these chapters are all completely focused on sacrifice. Animal sacrifices, grain sacrifices, offerings of animals, sacrifices of grain to the Lord. Leviticus is known as the heart of Torah. It is right in the middle of Torah, and it also accurately describes the heart of the Father. These first seven chapters, again, all about sacrifice and how they are to be done. Let's ask ourselves this question and lead ourselves into the answering of it subsequently. What is a priest's job? Right? Is he just there to take offerings and kill animals? Would he really is our father so unloving that he would just that he would dedicate an entire tribe of people to accepting offerings and killing animals if there wasn't some very deep a very meaningful truth in the workings of his tabernacle, of his temple. I'm going to say the answer to that is no. And the purpose of this video series is to hand you a flashlight so that you, in your own time, can reveal to yourself in keeping your nefesh that you can find the answer to that question. A little clue here, in Ezekiel chapter 44, 23, we learn that the priest's job is to teach the people the difference between what's clean and unclean, right? To teach them the difference between what is holy and unholy. we got to know what the difference is if we're going to be holy as the Father is holy. In hosting the sacrificial system at the temple... The priests accomplish these tasks. They also account for the offerings. They host the festivals. The festivals focus on God and fellowship around God based on the theme of that particular festival or feast. Okay, so let's get into chapters 1 and 2. In chapters 1 and 2, we're looking at the offerings at God's table meat offerings, and grain offerings. Okay, what do they represent? Let's look at the meat offerings first. We've got several different types of meat offerings. We've got a bull, sheep or goats, or birds. When it says a sacrifice of the herd, it's talking about bulls, a herd of like bison or oxen or cow, a bull. And then when we're talking about flocks, we're talking about sheep and goats. And then we've got our birds. So when a person is sacrificing a bull, what does this represent? Why does he say, I want you to bring a bull to my table instead of a frog or a cricket or a giraffe? Why is he telling us to sacrifice a bull as opposed to a pig or a lobster, or a wildebeest, or a gazelle. Why a bull specifically? He created all the animals, and then he says, look, I created bulls too, and I want you to sacrifice a bull. Okay. Well, the bull represents work, right? So in the last, say, thousand years or so, the meaning of a bull has kind of been lost to people. But in the first, in the bulk of, like if we're standing in heaven, okay, if we're up there in heaven and we're talking about times past, you know, those awful days when we were on earth and thanking God for using that time to uh, sanctify us, to be holy as he is holy so that we can have this awesome, awesome existence with him in the future. And we're talking about that time and somebody, you know, starts talking about a bull. Well, we're not going to 
we're gonna we're not gonna be talking about the understanding of a bull in like the last five hundred years of that six thousand years, right? Maybe last thousand years. We're gonna be talking about the bulk of that time, the first five thousand years. The majority of human beings who ever lived on planet Earth, they understood a bull to mean this, right? So at this point, you probably know what, what I'm talking about. If you have, uh, if you've got a, a, a garden and you need to plow that out, you need to work that soil, soften it up so that it can receive seed, well, you're not going to be able to do it yourself. You're not going to be able to stick a plow on the shoulders of your sons and daughters. They're not going to be able to do it for you. You have to put it on the shoulders of a bull, of an ox. That ox represents work, lots of strength in doing work. So that lots of strength in doing work is a picture of the Aleph, the very first letter, which is a picture of the father, right? He is the Aleph and the Tav. Why is he the Aleph? Why is he that kind of strength? Well, because he is the ox that is plowing through the soil of the earth. He is the one who's getting us from point A to point B. You stick a plow in the earth, you put it on that ox, and it doesn't matter how hard that ground is, the ox is getting from point A to point B. There's no stopping it. When a person sacrifices a bull, he's talking about sacrificing that kind of strength. What do sheep and goats represent now? What do sheep and goats do? Well, they are clothing, right? They provide uh, clothing or our coverings, and they provide food. That's really the only two things that sheep or goats are good for. Yeshua said that he has food which we do not know of. Right? He says that the Father is always working and he also is working. He's working that comes from an understanding of his word, from that mana, from that manna that comes from heaven. It gives him the ability to do his work. We have the word available to us even more so than he had available to him. We have the word available that he had available. We don't even have to work that hard to get it. And we have all the words that describe the work that he did and the work that those who sacrificed to do his work after he had passed into his glory. So that's what sheep and goats are about, sacrificing our clothing and our food for him. So then what in the heck are birds about? Yeah, well think about what a bird does, like its function. First of all, birds are pretty cool to look at. There's lots of people out there when once life has gotten to a point where um, all the excitement of life is kind of starting to wore out, um, you know, the ch childish excitement of life. A lot of people become bird watchers. Well, why is that? I'm going to conjecture that it's the nature of a bird that makes them interesting and pleasant to watch. So what does a bird actually do? Well, it has a beautiful song. Some of them have nasty songs and look beautiful. Some of them look nasty and have beautiful songs. There's all kinds of birds out there. But one of the things is that they sing. And another thing that they do... One of their really major functions is planting seeds. They take the seeds of different types of plants and they carry them far and wide. So that's what a bird's about. The birds represent our song and the seeds that we plant and where we plant them, right? God's telling us to sacrifice those things for him. And you'll see in these chapters, if you read them, that... Man doesn't get to say, oh, you know, I'm in this circumstance, so I should come and sacrifice a bull. That's not how it works. God is the one who makes those rules. 
God says, when you're in this circumstance as an individual, or when you are as a community in this circumstance, the appropriate sacrifice to bring to me is a bull. And then when you're sacrificing that bull, these are the things you're supposed to do with it. Same thing with sheep, same thing with goats and birds, whether it's male or female. Make sure it's without blemish. Make sure you do these specific things with its parts, right? And then we've got um, grain offerings. Fine flour is a grain offering. It's almost always fine flour. What's this about? What is this offering of... (coughs) (coughs) Excuse me. This offering of grain, of fine flour. What does it represent in the heavenlies? Why is he causing us more than just sacrificing a thing that we need? Deeper than that. Let's look past that. What is it that he is telling us about? What is this a shadow of? There's something happening in the heavenlies that we can't see because we're wrapped in sinful flesh, right? What is this clue, this shadow, this dark saying, this riddle? What does it mean? How can it give me a depth of spiritual understanding? How can it help me function better spiritually? For God, why is it in Scripture, the Holy Word? Well, think about how flour is produced. First, you have to get an ox and you've got to plow out that, that earth. Then, you've got to plant the seeds. Then, you've got to water it. Then, you've got to protect it from weeds and animals and weather. And you've got to fertilize it. Then, after all, I mean, that's months of work. Then, once all that's done, you throw most of the plant away. You throw the weeds out. You throw the chaff out. All you take is just those little tiny seeds. We're talking about like 10% of the plant, if not less. You come to the threshing floor and you start separating the the wheat from the tares, and you let the chaff blow away, and what's left is that little seed. And still, we're not done yet. Then you take that seed and you let it dry out. You prepare it, you store it, you take good care of it, and then when it comes time to use it, you crush it. After all that work, you take it and you crush it. You pull, you literally pulverize it. You put it between a rock and a hard place, and you spin that wheel until it becomes flour, fine flour, that's even all the way across the top. And then at that point, then it becomes usable to make it into a cake or something of that manner. It's a lot like wine. You do the same thing with a grape. Just like wine, at the end of a long road, there is still more work to do, and it is given to God yet still. Those noises you're hearing are construction noises across the street if they are coming through on the uh, on the video. They're probably cutting up concrete or something. Um, so, okay, so you, you go through all that work, and then you get this thing. What is it good for, right? Well, when it comes to grain offerings, it feeds both Yahovah and the priests. And we don't put leaven in this, right? If you don't understand what leaven is, ask the Father to teach you what he means by leaven. Okay, so that is the end of our first video. We've gone over uh, the purpose of Leviticus as a whole. We're diving into chapters uh, 1 through 6 here, and in this video we really focused on uh, bulls, sheep, goats, birds, and grain offerings, and uh, why it is that a good God has uh, decided that this is the canvas to teach us uh, how we ought to be administering sacrifice within our hearts, what we should be looking for. If it's God doing the sacrificing in our hearts, If it's our high priest that's really in our heart and it's not the deceiver, then it should look like this. All right. Uh, There should be another video. This next video is going to be chapters 3 through 7. I'm not sure if I'm going to break this into two videos or one yet, 
but the next video, if it exists, should be coming up on your screen now.